So I'm up here by myself right now, and uh, I don't know where to begin. Okay, here I go. So I'm walking around in these heels, and everyone's looking at me like, damn. And then Nina's over here trying to cover up my legs, and I was just like, just because I have nice legs doesn't mean I don't have a brain. So Nina is questioning the ways in which gender is constructed and policed, and the ways in which the audience projects meaning onto a body or an image. Nina's trying to create a space in which she can hold confidence in the face of classification. The practice of creating the space to hold confidence despite her deviations from normal, normal expressions is an inspiring personal and public practice that encourages personal acceptance. So ladies, I want you to make some fucking noise for my girl Nina. <laughs> I'm at the airport. You're on a stage. Most everything I've written, videotaped, said it's for you, and I don't even recognize it. And it doesn't make it less valid. It kind of makes it more valid. It's not something outside of myself, but me in the future. This me that will still encapsulate the old me, but it'll be different. Imagine a self always in progress. I'm writing this in a past towards a future, which is still referencing the past, referencing the future. This is how I remember the three women who raised me, standing behind me, beside me. I think of them as somehow being in my body, or because they raised it, they're here. And I get to carry that forward these parts of them that shaped me. I have to remember this when I'm giving this lecture. I have to remember that it is not about me, but for me, but from me. A generous act to talk about a history I've lived. Remember these women. Remember to not back down and stay in it. Remember not to leave your body and assess it from the outside. And the microphone copies my words a tenth of the second after I say them, reflecting them back at me, amplifying them to you. A self always in process. A self that points towards a present which never comes but always changes. This is to you, that you in flux. I was raised near an ocean. It is said that those who grew up near the ocean are romantics. Jose Munoz speaks about utopia as an island, surrounded by water. Every direction is horizon, a potentiality. I am interested in creating work that is a potentiality, which is a question, which ling lingers and leads somewhere else. I grew up near an ocean, towards a horizon which never comes. But I was in Orange County, surrounded by a normativity or a kind of hyper real in which everyone was participating. Those who stood at the edge of potentiality with me were bleached out by an evenly distributed light. Skin tanned, hair whitened, bodies altered, enlarged, shrunken, pleasing, assessed by their participation in this nexus. I was 14. I duct taped my chest as a bathing suit topped with a buzzed head and hairy armpits, and I was swimming, always swimming. I am saying this, paying attention to this, because it, I think it is important as an image, a history, and a metaphor. We'll return here. Somehow in my studies, in my adult life, in my academic ponderings, I've forgotten this person, this image. This year I've been studying femininity and gender legibility in culture as a way of confronting the impulse to ignore myself. I wanted to point a finger at the thing which labeled me, the thing which put me in a box and shut me up. But the question evolved into something less concerned with who to blame and more about the substructures, the undercurrent, which is in and between people. 
I recognize that I cannot exist outside of communication, that my body is coated with signifiers that I cannot escape, and this impulse to escape is something to be examined. The way I've found to work on, with, and against this is to give myself, my subjective position, some validity, for lack of a better word. To stand within myself and embody this incomplete, multifaceted character. I am looking towards a horizon that never comes, swimming in the very thing which makes up that horizon. We begin in admiration and end by organizing our disappointments. An idea, an ideal is perfect because it is not limited to any system. It is not contained or constrained. It is immaterial, amorphous, a potentiality, a sea. The process of communicating, materializing, or actualizing an idea is always a failure, an approximation, a charting. I have felt myself burdened by this, so frustrated that I have to get something out of myself in order to communicate with someone and it's never right. This has stopped many projects and manifestations, papers, performances, collages. I am now giving this position a certain kind of attention or believing, recognizing that it is not a finished place. I can manifest something which is not the resolution of that idea, but an embodiment of it. This searching can be a material, can be something to be seen or paid attention to. The best performances do not disappear, but instead linger in our memory, haunt our present, and illuminate our future. I began my study of femininity and approximating a feminine image. I tried to find sources, something everyone could recognize. The loss of the sense of the normal, however, can be its own occasion for laughter, especially when the normal, the original, is revealed to be a copy, an inevitably failed one, an ideal that no one can embody. All along, the original was derived. And with this, I found my attention shift from the importance of the original into the structure which is normal from what the thing is into what makes, surrounds, and codifies the thing. My initial impulse was to look at drag, which embodied and transformed femininity without denying its signifiers. I grew up with an incredibly attractive mother. Hi, mom. <laughs> she got a lot of attention, and I was usually present for these encounters. I felt extremely angry and protective of her, I learned to walk behind her, eye level with her butt, so no one could check her out from the back. I am interested in the relationship between gender and attention, and what this means for me. I feel as though I was denied anger as a child. It was something I learned to suppress and kind of embody. This is not your fault, mom. <laughs> I've noticed that I denied the feminine as a way of embodying the block I was between my mother and the men who gave her attention. I have found through my studies that I repeat the phrase, I don't want attention. I don't want attention. I don't want attention. I don't want attention. And I think this is where the study of femininity comes in. Um, I have had the impulse to be swallowed in a metaphysical discourse, in ideas bigger than me, in a sea perhaps. But in this process, I've forgotten that I am a body in this sea. I've come to recognize that I am not able to fully disappear. This body labels me. It is my access point to this world. And to not be aware of my body is to assimilate into a predetermined system in which thoughts are disembodied. Okay, anyways, it may seem irrelevant to talk about my relationship with my mother, but I'm trying to access how I felt like being feminine was a weakness that I did not want to be, so I tried to deny it. I made very clear boundaries. This is what a real woman looks like. This is what a fake woman looks like. Being a punk gave me something. Basically, it validated my anger 
gave me some support. And although I felt judged from this group too, I'm really grateful for the image it gave me of a female rage, a potentiality. Jose Munoz speaks about the potentiality that punk embodies as amateurism, that presenting, performing amateurism was a way of embodying potentiality, a way of pointing to a horizon, swimming in failure and disbelief. I felt this parallel anger and acknowledgement. It is important for me to go back to punk, to recognize a white femininity that wasn't weak, but something I recognize as giving me inspiration. I've noticed that white drag queens often perform black female songs or characters to access power. This was my initial impulse too, to perform attitude, sassiness, be a diva. I recognized that I was reaching these things through an appropriation, which allowed me to, once again, forget my body, the specificity of this body. I, could, I continue to not want to appropriate another culture, but stay within what is true to me and to try to unhinge it. How can vulnerability be power? My potentiality looks like an oscillation, a powerful vulnerability. For the art opening this Friday of Video and Performance Art's final show, I will be performing two hours a day, every day, for the duration of the show. I've built a small stage, a platform, and arranged a lighting kit and some curtains. I will stand on this stage in some kind of drag, holding presence, confidence, space, performing presence. There will be a pair of headphones near me which prompt the viewers to ask questions about my, my and their own gender, race, and cultural unconscious. I don't want to... Okay. I don't want to tell you anything, but I do want to ask a question to communicate something which could potentially resonate with you. I am trying to deal with this body, to recognize that ignoring it is to deny my subjectivity, the self-reflexivity that I need to communicate with you and modernity. Brecht says, reality alters. To represent it, the means of representation must alter too. We cannot communicate through predetermined roots. We must always come at the rendering differently. To me, this doesn't necessarily mean denying the past or dominant, but standing within the previous, present, and future as a specific subjective body. And to give this validity and strength this goes for the image of a woman I cannot be. I do not deny its presence, its past, nor its future, but constantly reassess my relationship to it as a process, a self in process. This is potentiality. This is the sea. This is my body at the edge of that sea, at once a part of that crowd and at once something separate from it in a moment. Did I start getting into the punk culture in Orange County or when I moved up here? When I lived there. Um, I, yeah, when I was 13, I was just being a punk in Orange County. <laughs> Mary Jane? Uh, how do you see your failure realized in this performance and um, what does that mean about the success? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, okay, this performance is a failure <laughs> because my, well, the idea or the ideal was me in drag, lip syncing, and like being a diva. That was the original idea for this performance. Um, 
And it's been like a negotiation with what is me. Um, like, I wrote this in an airport really fast. And it, I mean, it's something I've been thinking about a lot, but it, it's not the ideal. It's just me figuring it out. <laughs> Which I, I don't think that's a fa I mean, it's a failure because it's not the thing, but... I guess you're, you're actively experiencing the potential of your performance, and your whole writing was about that, that verge of potential. Mm -hmm. So, that seems like a successful failure. Yeah. <laughs> Kathleen? Yeah, I'm just interested in sort of like maybe a tension between a couple of lines of thought that happen in your performance. So one, one was about your realization that there was no original, right? That the whatever, like the relationship between drag and original femininity, that that turned out to be like about a doubling of something that already wasn't an original. Mm -hmm. But then there's this other line of thought that has to do, or at least like language around this, and like it has to do with authenticity and true me, and right, like this image of strong white femininity, or like who is this body and this specificity. And I'm just, I'm interested in the sort of tension between the authenticity and the kind of Always already a double mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yeah, I think what I've been finding out is that I can't, I can't just escape, escape, and I have to find where these things intersect in me. So like, I am totally embodying things which are which aren't original because there is none. But like, there are these like true intersections in like experiences and moments. Does that get yeah? Okay. Okay. Sally. Um, what are some of the prompts that you have for yourself, like reflection wise, as you go about the process you'll be doing in the gallery? Or the performance you'll be doing in the gallery? The prompts? Yeah, for yourself. Or what I call my mantras. <laughs> sure. Um <laughs> I mean, well that first the video where it's talking before this, what is kind of that, it's like these things that I try to keep in my brain that it's like not about me, but the stuff that I'm saying, and it is about me, but not, it's not just all there. Um, and remembering the people who raised me is a really big one, and that they have support from people. I don't know, is that what you're... Yeah, well, I, I just, I'm just so curious about what will come from your performance, and maybe I'm projecting like too soon what that could be, but I'm just really curious about um, I don't know, I guess I'm processing out loud, just I, I, I'm greatly anticipating your performance, and so um, I guess I just want to talk to you about it as it's going on. Yeah, no, I'm excited about it too. I really wish I could like be there. It's weird because I'm gonna be there, but I'm gonna be performing, so I can't be in their Yeah. Shaw. Um, I'm wondering if it was intentional when you say I don't want attention and the paper comes down and shows your face after you said it. It wasn't quite synced up. No, it wasn't supposed to be synced up. And then so, so but then it highlights your face. Mm -hmm. So what is, what, it's a little bit about what Kathleen is asking, in terms of your performing and then yourself and the doubling, what do you think now, if, if we talked about the, the drag, the performing of the drag needs to happen in some ways because you're saying it takes us there, it doesn't necessarily need to happen or does it? So the idea of you performing your own autobiographical position and then taking on a position where it's not necessarily you, where right? it's a performance, and this idea of wanting attention and not wanting attention, and remembering what your thoughts are. What my thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, earlier today, when I just went pee in there, I was like, thinking like, man, I got all these people right now, and I can just say anything I want. Like, it's really insane position to be in, um, and I think I'm terrified of sharing things from myself or speaking things to this many people because I want to be able to get swallowed again. I want to be able to like have a conversation and I don't want to just be like me preaching. Um, 
But that's the thing about like it being a performance and I want it to linger. Um, you know, so it creates some kind of dialogue or memory. Um, yeah, I don't know. But the, the paper coming down was genius. I'm really glad that, that happened. That's like a total accident, but yeah, it's good. Anders, is that good? Yeah, and just in terms of memory, I just wanted to make a comment that I noticed some people taking photographs and it was just, um, it, it, I think it did invoke that sense of wanting to remember what, what visually this looked like and how this appeared and kind of trying to record that as a kind of performance. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Hannah. <laughs> just going off of your, uh, what you were just saying about uncomfortability, um, sharing parts of yourself or sharing yourself to an audience. Uh, I am kind of inferring that's the motivation behind also having this double of you sh having that being in the light instead of because you here now being in, uh, in, in, like, in the light. Mm -hmm. And just wondering if you could talk maybe, I don't know, maybe talk about that intention, if that is your intention. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, um, well, in one of the critiques, I was my original idea was to just have like basically my Tumblr that I've collected all these images of like drag queens that I've collected for inspiration showing behind me while I talked and quotes. But then the whole question came up about like disembodied information and like that that's what I'm talking about and that um, that just perpetuates it because it's disembodied information and then me. And so I think it was a way of like asserting that, you know, myself as disembodied information and real, you know, doing the double thing. Yeah. Yeah. Naima? Um, it's interesting one of the ways that you sort of thought about rec reconciling um, this, uh, this question of authenticity and this question of um, kind of a lack of an original with trying to recognize, um, with trying to recognize the need, the, what's wrong with the need of escape, right? And how sometimes, right, the, the way I read it, or the way I understood it, was that sometimes this sort of impulse to say, well, there's no such thing as authenticity, can also be this thing of trying to like escape some of the particularity of you know our experiences and how they relate to our oppressions and powers and, and privileges. Um, and so that's just a comment that I think that really how that kind of resonated both in terms of your answer to that question and also the the way that I saw it working on in your performance. And then I guess my question is, um, in your some of your, I guess, newer found um, language and interest in thinking about femininity and race and their intersections, how, if at all, has that kind of come back into some of your relationships within punk? Like, how is that sort of received or not received, or do you feel like that's something you're able to engage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel like I'm as much in the discourse of punk as I used to be. That was like a birthplace for me as like a little tyrant. Um, but <laughs> now, yeah, now, I don't know. I mean, I think that was something I hadn't thought about and like came up through this. Like I, I had to go back and be like, okay, where is it? Where is it coming from? But um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that punk is like this simultaneous, like, really like unaware thing that doesn't consider <laughs> many things. Um, but also in this kind of like really beautiful way that's really all out. Um, yeah, and I think it's like getting Punk is kind of this way of like getting out of my own way and like performing when it's amateur, you know, and like giving that some validity and just being like, this is rough and this is it. Yeah. Hey, okay. Zach? No, you're just saying hey. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Hey, Julie. <laughs> Do you um, want to say something? Yeah, I just, I really like, I mean, I, I saw a you know, a previous version of this, and even then was struck by um, your use of the, the figure of Horizon that recurs throughout the piece, and this is a really beautiful kind of um, uh, figure, poetic figure, um, that I think allows you to go, to take us a lot of different places and, and, and theorize something really interesting that I, I mean, the, the idea that um, identity is this kind of ever receding horizon, right? Mm -hmm. It is this thing that, and the, the idea that it's formed by um, the meeting point of two bodies, whether it be air and water or air and land or something like that, but, and then that image of you swimming, always swimming, always swimming, is just beautiful. That. And I'm struck now by thinking about the horizontality of um, the, the screen and the chalkboard and that you're actually bisected. I'm just kind of, it's making me then do other things with the, um, the, the way this has been set up visually, so mm. thinking about, um, and the bisecting of the, the kind of boundary between the screen and you. Um, and these are two kind of horizon points that are never going to meet. I mean, unless you were to walk into that screen right Exactly, but that's sort of a hurrah, right? Your final gesture. <laughs> but there's just that's a, it's a, there's something really rich about that. I you know, that you keep finding that idea of horizon and horizontality because it's um, it's very captivating to me. Mm -hmm. Really beautifully written. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So,